It is not uncommon to see all sorts of challenge runs when it comes to Pokemon games, from single Pokemon runs to monotype Nuzlocke to character based runs. What makes this possible is the fact that Pokemon games are considered RPGs, role playing games which give you the freedom to determine things like your team composition and character builds. But Pokemon is not the only RPG out there. Take Fire Emblem for example. Although it is a lot more tactics focused, Fire Emblem is still an RPG. One might describe it as a chess RPG, but an RPG nonetheless. And as someone who loves to explore the perspectives of different characters, I was particularly intrigued by this one silly quirky gal in the latest Fire Emblem game, Yunaka. Hi. She was one of my best units during my first run of the game, but we get 35 other characters to use and can only deploy like 8 units at a time for most battles, so I didn't really get a chance to use most of them properly. Uh, it was a lot like Hop from Pokemon, changing up my team every other battle and not being too sure who's who and who does what well. So I decided to do a second run of the game in hard classic mode and focus my team building efforts around Yunaka. But how do you decide who else gets to be on the team? That's where supports come in. Every playable character in the Fire Emblem games has a list of units they can build support with. You do this by having these units fight alongside each other during battles or participate in between battle activities like sparring or sharing meals. And as their support levels grow, you unlock some conversations between these characters as well as in battle buffs when fighting next to each other. So to build a Yunaka center team, I just needed to take a look at all of the characters that she has supports with and use those guys. Everyone else? Well, classic mode Fire Emblem works a lot like Nuzlocke's. If the character dies in battle, they're considered permanently dead and can no longer be used. The main protagonist of Fire Emblem Engage is Alir. They're the divine dragon that's been asleep for a thousand years after battling the fell dragon. For this run, I chose to play as the female version of Alir and named them Papaya. Usually, the name of your character doesn't matter since everyone just calls you the divine one. Divine one. Divine one. But if I name myself Papaya, then the most important character of this run can greet me by my real name. Hiya, Papaya. The start of this game is pretty simple. It introduces the core mechanic mechanics of battle. Each turn you move all of your units, then the enemy gets to move all of their units. And you keep this up until you defeat all of the enemies, their general, or reach the exit to the map. Different units have different weapons, and engage works on a similar rock paper principle as Pokemon. Swords break axes, axes break lances, and lances break swords. Uh, by break I mean that you literally make the opponent drop their weapon, that way they cannot counter attack you. Otherwise the unit you are attacking gets the opportunity to hit you back as long as you're in range of their weapon and it works the same way if you're being attacked. The other important battle mechanic in this game is the engage rings, which work somewhat like dynamaxing mixed with z-moves. The equipping character gains different buffs and abilities depending on the ring they wear, and they can enter an engaged state which gives them additional weapons to use in combat, as well as an ultimate move that can be used once per engagement. An engagement only lasts 3 turns because, well, it's not you, it's them. Our first major battle begins after Papaya wakes up from a dream where they look very evil and are burning the whole place down, only to realize that someone has broken into the castle and is burning the whole place down. So you rush towards the ring room where your mom Lumera keeps 5 other engage rings and of course, a bunch of bad guys are blocking your way. Way too many for you and your 3 stewards to handle. Good thing the game decides to randomly throw in 3 extra characters, Alfred, the crown prince of Firenae, Etie, the buffest bow user in history, and Boucheron, who does not have any supports with Yunaga. We also managed to ditch clan, one of the 3 stewards during this battle, the only downside being the clan was our only mage unit, and we don't have anyone else who can do a lot of damage to heavily armored generals. But then I remember that Papaya has Marth's engagement ring, and Marth lets you use the rapier. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I'll just call it rapier. At least I'm gonna know I'm wrong 100% of the time, you know? The rapier, which is super effective against armored units. With the enemies out of the way, we enter the ring chamber only to find a shadowy figure who has stolen all of the rings and then tries to turbo murder us. But Lumera comes to the rescue and her dragon form and shoes away this intruder, then dies. Can't have a Fire Emblem game if the main protagonist's parent doesn't die. One of our living stewards did try to heal her, but fails, so we have to say our tragic goodbyes to this character that we've only met and have no emotional attachment to other than she kinda cute though. On the bright side, we now have another emblem ring, Sigurd. Oh, and the thief also dropped this little decoration that gives us the power to reverse time and undo actions during battle. Seems like a fair 
betrayed. Alfred also finally explains why he suddenly showed up to the castle and that's because his kingdom is being attacked and his mom sent him to fetch some help from Lumera. Uh oh. Well since Lumera is dead, we're the only divine dragon left that can land a helping hand here. On our way to Ferenay Castle we have to go through Flora Mill Town, which has been attacked by a bunch of corrupted. We also find Celine, Alfred's sister who escaped from Ferenay Castle along with their emblem ring, Celica, as well as her two retainers, Louis and Chloe. The bad news is that neither Celine nor Chloe have supports with Yunaka, so... <laughs> Once again, the enemy general is an armored unit, so Papaya has to engage with Marth and use the rapier to win the battle. Having saved the village, we get access to a whole bunch of new features, starting with post-battle exploration, where you can run around the map to collect resources and more importantly, adopt lost animals. For this run, I will only be adopting the dogs since they can get you materials like iron, steel, and silver, which can be used to make our weapons stronger. We also unlock a bunch of activities in the Somniel, our own personal castle in the sky where we go between each battle to help build up our units and strengthen their supports. And there's a lot of things to do there, like donate to the war-torn countries in exchange for better material drops after battle and more animals to adopt. A farm where you can have these adopted animals hang out and bring you items after battle. A little workout area with Alfred where you can do things like push-ups, and for some reason these are harder to do than real-life push-ups, so no thanks. You also have shops where you can buy healing items and weapons, as well as a grotto with a mysterious Pegasus doggy thing called Somni. If you feed him pet Somni, it will give you some bond fragments which can be used to play gacha for minor bond rings. These work like engage rings in that they give your units some stat boost and the ability to gain SP in battle, but are generally pretty weak in comparison. I made a few so that my non-engaged units can still collect some SP. Why do I care about SP? Because it lets you inherit skills from the engage rings. Basically, I can have some of the buffs from the ring as permanent buffs on a character without them having to wear that ring. We'll come back to this later, because right now we really need to get to Ferenay Castle and save the queen from those bandits. This was by far the hardest battle I've had during this run, and there weren't many hard battles in general, but this one, really hard. And that's because there are multiple armored units on this level and we do not have enough rapier uses to take them all on. Also there's this Steve guy that runs up to the treasure room and snags the armor slayer, a sword that would give us the advantage in this battle. So I needed to find a way to take down the thief while also not losing all of my characters to the horde of enemies that surround the room. Eventually I figured it out. I had to give Louis the Celica ring, which will let him use Warp Ragnarok to teleport right in front of the thief and hit him with a magic attack. This tactic only works with Louis since he has a very high defense stat and can survive being attacked by all of the other enemy units near the thief. Meanwhile, I had Papaya engage with Marth to take down the closest armored unit and on the next turn Louis finished off the thief. Was that sufficient? So now we could take our time getting to that treasure room. I had the fodder units distract half of the enemies while Yunaka's friends focused on the other half. Having cleared out the beginning area, I could now regroup and make my way up to the treasure room. With the armor slayer in hand, we can now tackle the throne room, which brings another challenge. All of these backup units can participate in chain attacks, which will do damage to Louis even if their normal attacks wouldn't. So once again, I had to engage him with Celica and use Warp Ragnarok to distract most of these enemies while Papaya took on the armored units. At this point, even a tank like Louis needed some help, so I had Alfred engage with Sigurd and use his override special attack to hit all of the enemies that were neatly lined up in front of him. Etie took out one of the axe units with her bow, and Louis could now safely retreat near her and use a vulnerary to heal up a little. I also had Fram, our last surviving fodder unit, use the freeze staff from the other chest to block one of the squares next to Louis, and that way one less enemy can reach him this turn. Sneaky Alfred could now finish off the backline archers while Louis tanked through the next line of attacks, and since everyone was targeting him, the rest of the squad could pick off the remaining enemies and focus on the general, who has 2 HP bars. Since this guy is an axe user, Papaya could break him with her sword, allowing Louis to do some major damage without taking a hit, and giving Etie the opening to finish him off. With the queen saved, we now get a smithy who can power up our weapons and a sparring ground to strengthen up our units and their bonds with their emblem rings. We also get access to paralogue battles, which are essentially side quest battles that give you more units. In this case, we get Jean, another healer unit that looks like he came right out of the Johto region in Pokemon. Now Jean isn't a character on Yunaka's support list, but since I struggled so much to clear the previous map, I thought it might be useful to have a fodder healer character until we get more of Yunaka's units for the team. Speaking of which, you might be wondering when is this Yunaka gonna show up? This whole run is centered around her, yet she's nowhere to be seen. Until now. Having saved Ferenay Castle, we're informed that they have one more emblem ring within their borders, hidden in a shrine to the north. And as we make our way towards this shrine, we run into the best character in the entire game. And oh boy is she a character.
character. As it turns out, Yunaka had heard this emblem ring calling to her, but some bandage managed to snag it away. So of course she now joins our party as we take them on to steal the ring back, like Ludwig did with his dream car. Quest. We also get to learn that Yunaka has killer's eyes, uh, I mean killer eyes, and can see really well in the dark. This way we can see the thief who stole the ring and get it back safely. This emblem ring is for Mikaya, whose special weapon is a magic attack that conveniently lights up the area so your other units can see what's going on. And once again, the enemy general uses an axe so we can easily finish him off. After the battle, Yunaka admits that she didn't just stumble upon this ring, she stole it, and that she lied about it since she panicked. Apparently, this is something that Yunaka does a lot, since she also lies to us in her first support conversation, but once again has the willingness to admit it right away. And since she didn't just take the ring and run the second time, and Mikaya vouched for her, Papaya and Alfred decided to have her join our team instead of sending her to jail or something. I don't know if there is a jail in this game, considering what's happened to all of the other bandits we've seen so far. Anyways, the best character in the game is now finally part of our party. By this point, Papaya had collected enough SP to inherit one of the most useful skills in the game, Canter. This allows her to move two blocks after attacking, which means we can hit an enemy and get out of the way, making room for our allies to get in and attack as well. We also got to use the forge to power up Yunaka's dagger and even engraved it with the emblem of the holy war to make it do more damage and help her avoid getting hit. Some of our other units got minor upgrades as well. Alfred inherited the avoidance boost from Marth. Etia raised her hit rate so that her bow attacks won't miss. Louis picked up Lance power which lets him do more damage at the expense of him dodging less attacks, but let's be honest, he wasn't good at dodging to begin with. We also did another paralog level to rescue and recruit Anna, the tiny merchant who could be used to farm coins in this battle. Once again, I was really doubting my skills since this was my first ever hard classic run of a Fire Emblem game, and just like with Jean, I wanted to have an extra character to help me out in case I needed it. As I learned shortly after, I really did not need the extra help. Our next battle was on the bridge to Brodia, where we were joined by three more characters, Dead, Soon to be Dead, and Citrine, a rich girl from Brodia who uses magic. Finally, we have a magic unit again. We also get to meet Hortensia from the country of Alusia, who uses an emblem ring in battle. She wasn't much of a challenge and also dropped a master seal. We can use these seals to reclass our units into something stronger. So Louis got upgraded to general and Etia to a sniper. We also had unlocked a bunch of supports with Yunaka, so there is some more things to learn about this character. In all three conversations with Alfred, Etia, and Louis, she very much seems to want to hide her past, being afraid to slip up, being suspicious that no one is trying to snoop on who she might be, and then being sized up by Etia, not because Yunaka looks like a dragon tamer from the Pokemon games, but due to her muscular physique. Etia has one brain cell, and all it does is think about muscle. Anyways, we made our way to Brodia Castle, where we met the jovial King Morton and his son Diamond, as well as their emblem ring Roy. But the meeting was cut short by an attack from Princess Ivy and the Illusion Army, who were there to take our rings. Of course, the only one doing any actual taking in this run is me, because every time the game throws us a random new character that we can't use, I make sure to take all of their items first. And Amber comes with a very good item, the Killer Lance, which has a very high crit rate. This is going to be a very useful item since critical hits do triple damage in this game. Overall, this battle was fairly easy since there were a lot of flying units, and Etia could easily one-shot them with her bow attacks, including Ivy, who was the main enemy general. And since we won the battle, we also get to take Ivy's emblem ring, Leaf. We learned that there are more enemies on their way to the castle, so King Morton decides to lead his own army to counter them and defend Brodia's borders. I thought they went out of business. While he was off fighting, we took some time to go back to the Somnio and power up our team a bit more. This includes reclassing Citrine into a Sage for more magic damage and Alfred into a Lance Fighter so that he can become a Royal Knight later on. This way, I can have two healing units that are actually supposed to be part of the Yunaka squad. We also went to inherit some more skills from the new Emberlings, like Build 3 from Leaf for Papaya. Every weapon in this game has its own weight, and if you equip a weapon that's heavier than your build, your character will lose speed. The thing about speed is that if you have 5 or more speed than your enemy, you get to attack twice, but it's the same the other way around. And since the Armor Slayer is pretty heavy, the extra build will help Papaya wield that weapon without getting double hit during the enemy phase. We also inherited Tone Precision for Citrine and Knife Precision for Yunaka, both of which boost the unit's hit rate and avoid rates, meaning our attacks will hit more often and we will also evade more attacks, just like Yunaka keeps trying to evade suspicion from Citrine, and Etia is trying to avoid getting shipped with Alfred and becoming queen? I mean, she already has a crown and everything. One brain cell, I tell you. Anyways, now that we're done goofing off, we make our way to the Brodian border, only to watch King Morden get defeated by King Hyacinth and his emblem ring. But instead of getting to fight him, we have to battle against Ivy 
once more, and in this battle, King Morton isn't the only one getting killed. Since we now had actual healers, it was time for Jean to go. Lapis might have survived the battle on the bridge, but could not survive the battle in the snow. Fram got chopped off by Kagetsu, and Diamant lost hold of his emotions, running straight into enemy line without a plan. We also recruited Jade, who only had a steel axe and a weakness to fire. So yeah, these illusions were pretty ruthless during the battle. We still won though. Having sustained heavy losses, it was now time to buff up the remaining team. So Yunaka inherited a Void plus 10 from Marth, Alfred got the Staff Mastery for later, and for now we just forged that Killer Lance up to level 5 and gave it to Alfred since he can't heal at the moment, he might as well kill. And then we made our way to Illusia Castle for some revenge. We were once again up against Hortensia who thinks we've killed Ivy in the previous battle. A lot of units did die during that skirmish but Ivy was not one of them. Since she wouldn't listen to reason, we had to go and deal with Hortensia yet again. The only problem was that she'd instantly go after Louis, who is very weak to magical fire attacks. So instead we had to reverse time and back off a little to clear away all of her supporting units. Then Yunaka initiated the attack while Alfred distracted Hortensia. Citrine healed up the prince, who could now run in and help Yunaka finish off Hortensia's first health bar. And since Hortensia is a flying unit, Etie could easily just walk right in and one-shot her second health bar with a single bow attack. Having defeated the princess, the squad regrouped and healed up, then made their way into the cathedral where corrupted King Morton lay waiting. We took out the corrupted that were trying to support him and he nearly took out Citrine. Good thing she inherited that tone precision skill. Alfred landed a critical with his killer lance, leaving the corrupted king with just one health bar and Papaya put him out of his misery. That left one more general in this battle, King Hyacinth with his own emblem ring. This ring gave him the ability to shoot five long range arrows from way beyond our reach, so we had to heal up Etie and keep pushing forward. The ring's other special power is to summon shadow clones who only have one HP, but they would participate in chain attacks, so we took out one of the clones to make room for Louis, who helped finish off Hyacinth's first health bar, and then engaged with Marth to finish off the boss with her signature Lodestar Rush. And just when we thought the battle was won, the one who killed Lumera shows up to stop us. And then we find out that the Fell Dragon has been revived after drinking King Morton's blood. Unlike us, he can transform into an actual dragon and then decides to eat Hyacinth for breakfast. I would've gone for a banana or something lighter, but hey, you do you, Sombron. Hortensia flips out and unhoods the mysterious murderer, only to discover that it's John Cena! Vale. I completely forgot to mention her earlier, but Vale has been this like sweet little lost child that we keep running into after some of our battles. But she's just been kind of shy, had a hurt leg, and gave us directions. And now she's here, claiming to be the Fell Princess. Although she doesn't seem to remember meeting any of us. And as if things weren't going bad enough, the Elite Four show up out of nowhere. My bad. The Four Hounds. While our backs are turned, Evil Vale somehow manages to snag all of our emblem rings, as well as the Time Crystal that we've been using. Sombron then turns the rings evil? I know this was supposed to be like the big turning point in the game, but I feel like the writing broke my suspension of disbelief a bit. That's because despite having lost all of our rings and being surrounded by a giant dragon on one side and the elite four on the other, we still somehow managed to just leave the castle. Anyways, we get instantly thrown onto the next map, where we're trying to run away while the corrupted attack us using the emblem rings that we used to have. Good thing they didn't take our gacha rings. At first I thought that if we defeated the corrupted with the stolen rings, we'd get to take the ring back, but Veil somehow snags them before we can, and gives them to another corrupted instead. While we cleared the way ahead, Yunaka stays behind in the woods to pick off any corrupted that tried to chase us down. I should mention that placing characters in woods boosts their avoid rate, and Yunaka has a personal ability that boosts her critical rate if she engages in battle from a special terrain, so don't worry, she's totally fine. And since we were making good progress, Evil Veil calls the four hounds to go after us as well, but we also get backup. Princess Ivy had a change of heart after seeing how the fell dragon manipulated her father into becoming evil and then ate him for breakfast. So she decides to join our side along with her two retainers and two emblem rings that she stole from the castle since everyone just kind of left the castle to chase after us. Her thief retainer Zelkov also somehow managed to steal the time crystal from Evil Veil. Vale. So once again we have access to Control Z. Our first new ring is Lin, the super sniper shadow clone ring that Hyacinth used against us in the previous chapter. The other is Lucina who looks a lot like Marth but has more team oriented buffs. The only 
bad news about all of this is that Kagetsu and Ivy don't have any supports with Yunaka, so we had to feed them to the hounds. Having survived this life or death situation, Yunaka decides to open up a bit about her past. She used to be called Laramar and was abandoned by her parents at a young age. Some assassin adopted her and taught her all about killing, and even though she's left that life behind, she goes as far as to admit how grateful she is to Alfred and the others for accepting her, despite trying to hide her past from them, and how she feels like it's unfair for them to just trust her without knowing anything about her past. But they still did. Alfred may be a bit weird, but he's got a heart of gold. And he really needs to grow a second brain cell. Anyways, after all that heartfelt confession, Yunaka tried to cook up a thank you meal, but she was so touched and teary eyed that it didn't turn out so well. Zelkov even thought she was trying to poison him. I certainly know a certain someone who'd go that far, but not Yunaka. At this point in the game, we unlock some more paralog battles, but instead of giving us new units, they increase the possible bond levels with our rings from 10 to 20, giving us even better skills to inherit. The only catch is that we have to defeat the emblem in battle. I won't cover most of these battles in detail like the previous chapters for the sake of time, just know that they're usually pretty straightforward, like take out the support units then go after the emblem, or defeat the bad guys in front of the tent so that they don't summon more reinforcements, or defeat a couple of bad guys and then take down the… you get the point. Next up, we upgraded Yunaka to a steel dagger which does a lot more damage. Sorry Zelkov. We also reclass Papaya from a dragon child class to the divine dragon class, and then made her way into the desert to search for some help. There we ran into Fogato, captain of the Sentios, and helped him save some desert dwellers from the corrupted. He did have two retainers, but since neither of them had supports with Yunaka, eh, you know the drill by now. Meanwhile, Yunaka and Etie were having a field day, taking out all of the corrupted with ease. The desert folk were so grateful that we rescued them, that they ended up giving us some useful items after the battle, including a master seal which I could now use to ascend Alfred into a holy knight, so he too can heal up our team. I also reclassed Etie into a warrior, so that she can have a higher build and use an axe in case we needed to break enemy units. Then we went to Sohn Palace, where we met Queen Sephoria, who seemed to be handling all of the corrupted and illusion soldiers just fine. This made Sohn seem like one of the most well-organized countries, until we asked them for their emblem ring, and then they mentioned a doodad drawer. Red flags aside, the queen remembers that her daughter Tamara took the ring with her when she went out camping in the nearby oasis. Of course, when we got to her camp, we found out that they were being attacked by bandits in the dark. Good thing Yunaka's got them killer eyes. And we also get two more units to join our team. Marin, the animal-loving furry girl, and Panette. No, I don't know why she's dressed like that, but she's pretty cool, so leave her alone. The bad news is that Tamara does not have any supports with Yunaka, which means that just like Alfred, Prince Fogato will have to lose his sister in this run. Honestly, the hardest part of these battles is having to kill off a unit I liked. After the battle, Yunaka had a talk with Zelkov about how he's acting too much like the assassin he used to be, so he got reclassed into a furry knight, just like Marin. Even though Yunaka already came out about her past life to the previous squad, she still wasn't too comfortable showing her true self to Fogato, so instead of going out to party it up with the prince, she went to make some friendship flower crowns with Etier. When we returned to Somme Castle with some good news, we were once again greeted by Hortensio, who just walks right into the castle and holds the queen hostage. This reminds me of those videos where someone puts on a green vest and sneaks into places without security really checking up on them. And to top it all off, the hounds also show up, so now it's a full-fledged battle. This kind of reminded me of the Ferenay Castle battle at the start of the game, but since we have a lot more units, this fight is a lot easier. We got to the treasure rooms long before any thief could consider it, and got some really useful items like these boots which can permanently increase a unit's stat, in this case their movement, but we'll save those items for later. Anyways, we made it to the throne room and took down the hounds, then finished off Hortensia with relative ease. After seeing that her sister Ivy is somehow still alive for cutscene reasons, Hortensia decides to join us and give us her emblem ring, Byleth from Three Houses, the only other Fire Emblem game I've played. Although I don't remember Byleth being a dancer, I'm very confused. Now Alfred can inherit some of the professor's good luck, while Panette can inherit Wrath from Ike. He was the ring we got from Tamara. The cool thing about Wrath is that Panette's critical rate will increase by 1% for each point of HP she has lost, up to 30. And since she tends to take a lot of damage, that meant she'll be getting a lot more criticals. To help her out even more, I refined her killer axe to level 4 and engraved it with the emblem of the academy, which boosted its crit rate all the way up to 45%. The warrior class seemed like a better fit for her as well, especially since it can do extra damage by attacking broken enemy units. So I had her gain bow proficiency by training with Lin and reclassed her just like Etie. Speaking of which, Etie got to inherit some speed from Lin, and Furry Zelkov got some extra dexterity. I'm still not sure what dexterity does, but hopefully it helps him out a bit. Yunaka tried to befriend these new units a bit more, but she didn't like how Marin tries to monologue during battle and got 
got called out for acting all zappy by Panette, mainly because she too had to change the way she talks to fit in as Tamara's retainer. Instead of outright admitting her past, she goes to Fogato to ask how he keeps up the good vibes all the time, to which he responded, show people a little trust. I guess in her previous line of work, Yunaka really did have to be suspicious of everyone, but not anymore. To practice showing trust, she goes to Citrine and tells her about how she's been gathering intel on the Brodian assembly, not to assassinate them, but in order to pitch a project where she sets up a fund to help underprivileged kids, that way they don't have to end up like her. This touches Citrine's rich heart, she offers to help start this fund. I consider this an absolute win. What I didn't consider a win is reclassing Yunaka into a furry knight for the better stats. Sure, she gains some movement and build, but I don't really like the look of it. I also have like 3 furry knights on the team now. I tried reclassing Yunaka into some of the other options like Swordmaster, Hero, Halberdier, Royal Knight, Berserker, Sniper, General, Paladin, Griffin Knight, Wyvern Knight, Mage, Mage Knight, and High Priest but I didn't like any of them, so I decided to just keep her as a furry knight for a bit and then reclassed her back to Thief later. Had to go for fashion over function on this one, despite the cool animations she gets as a wolf knight dog person. Our next chapter leads us to the second emblem ring in Som, found in an old abandoned castle. There we meet Seadol, but a lot of times his name sounds like Sea Dog, so I think I'll just call him Connor instead. Connor is the only dancer class unit in the game, and even if he wasn't part of the Yunaka squad, he's also the only character that this game actively makes you protect, at least for his introductory chapter. I'm surprised they didn't do this for Alfred, Ivy, Diamond, literally any other character which continues to appear in the game's cutscenes. Fire Emblem Three Houses did that and I really think this would have made me more attached to the characters in this game and I think it made its storytelling feel a lot more solid than this one. Anyways, we take out the corrupted that ambushed Connor and recruited him to join our team, along with the ghost of this fortress which turned out to be Corrin, one of the most useful emblem rings in this game. I'll explain explain why later, there's a lot of reasons. Just by wearing her ring, you can change up the terrain and in Connor's case, we can make a wall of ice, which also clears away all of the miasma. We don't like miasma because it makes our units as bulky as grass in Zelda games and turns enemy units into Soto Wodo blocking the way in Pokemon Gold. But thanks to Corrin, miasma is cured. Etienne and Panette take the lead, wiping out all of the corrupted in her way while Hortensia stays behind to distract the one guy we spared. Can you tell that she has no supports with Yunaka? The rest of this chapter follows a similar pattern where we clear up the miasma, root the corrupted, and then go to the next room. Unless you're the corrupted who kills Hortensia, that guy just stood around there breaking a bunch of walls because he had nothing better to do. Having finally escaped from the haunted castle, we go back to the Somnia where Connor now hosts a tarot card reading booth. I'm not sure what to do with this information, so I never bothered using this feature again. If you know what any of this stuff means, please let me know in the comments below. Our next chapter leads us back to Firinae for some reason, where we have a coastal battle against two of the Elite Four and are joined by Hortensia's retainers, who had stolen yet another ring from the bad guys. Erica and her twin brother, who I never used, but something tells me his name isn't Eric and that disappoints me. Gold Mary nearly dies trying to take out a worm, which got me a bit worried because I was under the impression that she's a really good unit. Good thing we have Citrine who can heal her. My main man Louis was also knee deep in trouble since he was very weak to magic attacks and this horse mage nearly finished him off, so I decided it was time to start using those permabuff items I've been stockpiling. Probably not my brightest move, but I had Lewis use two talismans to boost his resistance, which should help him at least bulk through one magic attack without passing out. Zato might be fabulous, but he does not have any supports with Yunaka, so I had to send him off to try to solo a dragon. Spoiler alert, he couldn't solo the dragon. Marnie was a bit annoying to take out since she had the two warrior monks guarding her. The little shield icon means that if I attacked an adjacent unit, the monk would come in to guard them. So I had Yunaka engage with Korin and use the dragon hand hyper beam thing to damage all of them, stun them so that they couldn't move, and also put a special tile under their feet so that they can't dodge our other attacks. This felt a lot like Sigurd's special attack but with a ton of debuffs for the enemies that you've hit. After the battle we got to see a lot more support conversations. For example, Yunaka hates doing chores and is very amazing at impressions. I do have to take a step back and give a round of applause to Laura Post who voiced Yunaka in the English dub because when I was watching this cutscene I thought they just played the actual characters lines here but no, it turns out that she did the 
the actual impressions herself, which made Yunaka feel even more real and authentic and awesome as a character. Connor noticed how good Yunaka's acting is and tried to convince her to play a role in his next performance. She was unsure. Meanwhile, Goldmary is out there stealing Atie's potatoes. This is exactly why you get a Yunaka run and not a Goldmary run. Anyways, back to the main story of this game, we reach the port town of uh, Flora Port, where we see multiple working windmills? Pokemon, take note. And we have to fight a grand total of six bosses at the same time. You've got the Elite Four, Evil Veil, and Corrupted Hyacinth, who's back for revenge, even though the Fell Dragon was the one who killed him. We didn't do anything to this man. We had to split the squad in two, that way one half could take on the enemies to the north, while the other goes for the guys on the west. And the north squad did pretty well. Thanks to those talismans, Lewis could bulk through a Warp Ragnarok attack and then leave Gris right open for Etienne and Papaya to finish off. Meanwhile, on the west side, we've got Marnie, Mavier, and two dragons rushing at the squad while they struggle to stay alive. The most annoying part is that Marnie has Roy equipped, and he seems to work like a Focus Sash, which will allow her to live with 1 HP even if we blast her with a powerful fire type attack multiple times. And since she has two health bars, that means we have to attack her a total of four times to knock her out. This is a problem since it also puts off my weaker units in range of the other enemies like this dragon. So I had to reverse time multiple times and try a bunch of different tactics until I finally found a winning solution. First, we had to bait the enemy units to get a little closer. Then we had Panette destroy Mavier's first health bar. Connor uses his dance skill to give Panette a second attack, and with her 80% critical rate, she can easily finish off general number two. Then Yunaka and Marin team up to finish off the worm that's causing us the most trouble. All of Marnie's support units try to go after Citrine, but she manages to dodge most of their attacks and nuke them with her powerful magic. On our next turn, we can easily finish off Marnie and then heal up the squad before taking on Hyacinth and his army. Meanwhile, Evil Veil tries to attack Papaya but does zero damage, and then gets sniped by Etie and finished off by Lewis. Panette easily obliterates Hyacinth's first health bar, then tanks through his ultimate move and since he wanted a show, I engaged her with Lucina and used her ultimate move, which has all of your nearby allies join in on a chain attack to finish off the king once again and let us take his emblem ring. Leaf is back in our hands. That just left Zephia, who was easily sniped out of the sky by Etie and Papaya. But since the bad guys don't play by Nuzlocke rules, they got to run away once again. Although Good Veil did take over for a moment, and as a sign of good faith, she tosses a Sigurd's ring from the boat while they float away. In my opinion, this was the hardest main story battle in the whole game. And one of the main reasons we won was because half of my units on the Western squad inherited the quality time skill from Corrin, which would heal all adjacent allies after the unit finishes their move. Although it was also a good reminder that I really needed to figure out how to build some of these characters, since Fogato, Marin, Goldmary, and Citrine were dying way too much. First up was Citrine, who was simply getting hit too often, and since we finally have Leaf again, I could have her inherit his build skill. That way she can carry those heavy magical tomes without losing much of her speed stat. Apart from determining how many times you get to attack the enemy, speed influences the character's avoid rate, so the higher the speed, the more attacks she should be able to dodge. I also gave Goldmary the build plus skill for the very same reason. Marin got reclassed into Griffin Knight, that way she can have more mobility and also heal some of our team. And since Citrine still wasn't bulky enough to carry the stronger magical books, I reclassed her to Mage Knight for some extra build and some extra movement. I had no clue what to do with Fogato, so I left him alone. I really wanted to test out how these changes played out, so I went to do Leaf's Paralog Battle, the only Paralog Battle I'm gonna talk about, because this is one of the most broken and difficult battles in the entire game period. Forget having to fight six generals, these random guys at the bottom could shoot ballistas at my team from so far away that it would take me at least two extra turns to reach them. Basically, if any of my units could be one shot by the ballistas, they would be one shot by the ballistas. But then I realized that I could just bait the ballistas by using Lin's Shadow Clone since they only had one HP. So you'd think we'd be done by this point, but nope, there's a whole wall of armored units waiting for you across the bridge and they have another ballista. And once you clear those guys out, there's another wall of units, this time horse mages, who rush in and nuke any lone units trying to push forward. And of course, Leaf will rush in with them to make sure at least one of your units dies. And just in case you haven't had enough, there is one more ballista that will shoot at you from the north. Wahoo! The solution to this whole maddening level was to have Citrine engage with Corrin and make use of another one of her special skills. When she hits an enemy while engaged, they will get stunned with our dreadful aura, which prevents the target from moving. So Citrine could basically stay out of range and stunlock Leaf with her electric attacks and wait for her other units to chip away at his supports. Needless to say, Citrine and Corrin were key to winning this battle, making it one of my favorite battles of the entire game. And it wasn't just because of how much strategy I had to use to actually
actually win. Lore-wise, this battle is based around the Thracia River, and for those who don't know, which is probably 99.9% .9 of you, most of Thracia is in modern-day Bulgaria. I'm Bulgarian! So to my three Bulgarian viewers, you guys should really get and play some Fire Emblem. Let's show some support to the game that actually gives us the tiniest bit of representation. To everyone else, look, Yunaka's now practicing her role with Connor, except she's not too keen on being the lead. Nobody tell her. Oh no, she's trying to poison us again with her cooking. I didn't even know G-Rank was an option. But hey, that's kind of relatable because if I try to cook, it would also be G-Rank. <laughs> Anyways, our next battle is on a boat towards Illusia, where we once again use Lin's shadow clones to distract all of the enemies on the boat and have Panette go ham on everyone else on the other boat. We also get to recruit old man Linden, who just has one book and one healing item with him and sadly, zero supports with Yunaka. When our boat reaches its destination, we're shocked to find out that the town is completely empty and completely corrupted. So we fire off our boat torpedoes to clear out some of the miasma, then make land and push on. Here we have to split the team into three since there's essentially three separate hallways. On the top we have Yunaka taking down a worm on her own, on the bottom we have Zokov trying to see if there's anyone left alive to rescue, only to get jumped by a bunch of corrupted, but hey at least one of them has a hold item that you can get if you kill it, I killed it. And in the middle we have another unit to recruit who sadly does not have any supports with Yunaka. I am also reminded of fighting a bunch of enemies in Miasma is not a good idea. To top it all off, Papaya and Panette needed to hold off two generals and a bunch of horse units in the middle until the other two squads could pincer in. Thankfully, Citrine could clear away most of the Miasma thanks to Corrin's ring and also stunlock Mavier to buy us some extra time. We then managed to take him out even though he has 3 HP bars and finish off the last Corrupted with Panette's 100% crit rate. That literally leaves just Marnie with just 1 HP bar and 1 Shadow Clone to distract her, right? She's gonna go after the Shadow Clone that has 1 HP and not one of our units, right? Right? Wrong! She goes after Gold Mary and just obliterates her. So I had to rewind time, spare some of the Corrupted, and go after Marnie with Panette's 100% crit rate. From this dead port town, we make our way back to Illusia Castle where Gris wants to play hide and seek with us. Since him fighting us means a warp Ragnarok to the face, I had Marin engage with Byleth and perform the Goddess Dance. So now Yunaka and Alfred could rush in and take care of his first health bar. Since he didn't want to play anymore, Gris returns to the throne room while we continue to approach in the dark. In this battle, I could see just how much most of my units have grown. Fugato could pick off enemies from a distance, Marin could heal and dance for us, Citrine had become my most reliable stun-locking magical nuke, but Gold Mary, she was kinda just there. I guess she helps out Yunaka with chores or something. Anyways, Gris had informed us that Papaya isn't actually a divine dragon, but a fell dragon, a child of Sombron. Then he gives us the Celica ring and leaves. Since Marnie and Mavir weren't happy about how Zephyr was running things, they decided to help us out and take us back to Lumera's castle, which is where the four hounds had agreed to meet. But since she doesn't tolerate betrayal, Zephyr stabs Marnie and kills her. This is very unrealistic because Marnie is an armored unit and would only take like two damage from that knife attack. Anyways, Mavir flips out and joins our groups in hopes of getting revenge, and since he doesn't have supports with Yunaka, Mavir also gets to hit the, uh, never mind. He's really good at dodging. And since the game decided to send in like 500 reinforcements from every angle, my only option was to quickly go after Evil Veil before the rest of my team joins Marnie in Pokemon Sword. Veil comes to her senses for a moment, giving us the last ring we needed to complete the set. But then Sombron just rolls up and tries to kill her. And for some reason, Papaya decides to play hero just like Lumera and takes the hit instead. And then Sombron adds salt to the wound by telling Veil that Papaya was her long lost sister. He takes all 12 of the emblem rings once again and uses their power to raise his land from the ocean and then make a giant wormhole in the sky. Get it? Worm? Like dragon? With his new superpowers, Sombron turns Veil vale evil once again and she kills the rest of our team. The end? Question mark? So remember that one dream we had at the start of the game about everything being on fire? Well we seem to be here again, but it's a thousand years ago and now we get a bit of context. It's Papaya defeating Sombron, but it turns out that he was only pretending to be dead and kills Papaya in the past when she lets her guard down. The only reason we return to life with blue hair is because Lumera comes to our rescue and gives us half of her divine dragon powers, it's divine is the blue one. But that doesn't matter now since we are dead, again. <coughs> And uh, so is Good Veil, vale, apparently, except she's not dead, she can somehow go back to her body, take off the crown that possesses her, and use her fell dragon powers to return Papaya once again, but this time as a corrupted. I, I, 
Okay. Now that we're back, the squad very easily takes out all of the corrupted, while Papaya restores power to the rings and then has the rest of the team collect them. Veo and Mavir stay back to try and fend off the incoming corrupted, but both of them fail because they don't have any weapons. I wonder who took them. There were only two positive things that came out of this battle. First was that Papaya died again, that's not the positive thing, uh, but then got revived a fourth time with the power of the 12 rings and became the 13th emblem. The fire emblem. Engage. The other good thing is that we picked up the Brionac, a very powerful pole arm that can only be used by S rank lance wielders. And we have one of those, Gold Mary, who has been utterly useless so far. She could now be promoted to Helberdeer and ditch all those other random weapons. I also decided to use all of those perma buff items on her, as well as getting her some extra speed from Lin. Bogato did mention how most folks are good if you give them a chance, so I guess it's time to give Gold Mary a chance to be more useful in battle. To try out her new build, I went to do the final paralog battle where we get the packed ring for a papaya. So sorry. Now that's the kind of improvement I like to see. With the packed ring in hand, it was time to get S support with Yunaka. This should give us some extra battle buffs, but I think we also ended up getting married? Maybe this is a sign that I've been single for too long. Anyways, now that Sombron has his superpowers, we need to break the three dragon crystals for reasons that I do not remember. It is a video game, that is the reasons. The first crystal is in a lake of lava, where Gris and Dragon Lady shoot fireballs at us. So, Fogato, Yunaka, and Gold Mary team up to take down Zephia, then finish off Gris the next turn. And then we get this weird cutscene where Zephia gives us a turbo time crystal so that we can break the next dragon shard. This is a bit of a weird turn of events considering how she was super upset at everyone else for not being loyal to Sombron this entire game. And then the game tries to introduce some like love shipping section between Gris and Zephia? I mean, why now? And if you aren't confused enough yet, the turbo time crystal takes us back 1000 years where we battle the evil version of Papaya who sounds like a soulless robot. Robot. I will prevent that and attacks us with a bunch of avalanches, but she stands no chance against S support Yunaka. We then see that it is right after this battle that Fel Papaya meets Lumera and decides to take her side, secretly. Back to the present, we now have to fight uh, Corrupted Lumera, guess who's back, and she's very creepy in her corrupted form. This battle was a bit more difficult than the others, since it had constant waves of reinforcements running in and putting pressure on you to finish the battle as fast as possible. So Yunaka and Panette took care of the first health bar, and then Etier and Sigurd finished her off. This was a bit ironic considering Lumera was using Sigurd's ring when we first met her. We give Lumera one last pinky promise to protect the world before she dies for a second time in this one game. With all three crystals broken, it was now time for us to fly the Somnio into the wormhole and fight Sombron to save the world, I think. Except I got confused again because it sounded like Sombron was about to leave our world and never return, but then Papaya goes among us and says no, you're actually gonna come back one day and try to destroy us so we have to stop you now, and then Sombron grows, you and what army? And then he poofs away all of our emblem rings, and then Yunaka goes, I can impersonate the emblems, and everyone else in the team gives a little speech about how they believe in Papaya, so then somehow, we manage to call all of the rings back and engage in this final battle against Sombron, who now has other emblem rings that are the villains from previous games, but they don't have the sprites, so I don't really know who's who. Basically, all we have to do is defeat these other emblems to destroy Sombron's shield, and then attack him with everything we've got. Like Atie with Sigurd, can dodge and then move out of the way after an attack. We also had Panette with Roy who takes out a whole health bar with just one critical hit. Louis is so tanky that not even a giant dragon could do damage to him. Come on Sombron, he can't even touch Louis. How are you gonna go take over a whole other world man? But the best part is that Connor can dance and let our best unit, which in our game is Panette, have another turn and then with her turbo high crit rate just finishes off Sombron. I didn't have to do anything and Yuraka didn't have to do anything either. With the world saved and Sombron defeated, all 12 of the emblems say their goodbyes and then we get to watch this beautiful end screen that tells me just how many of my units I've killed off in this run. I was really hoping they would just skip the dead units and tell me about the living ones but nope, nope, I just, I had to sit there and watch all 24 of them be like, yep, they died during this battle, he died during that battle, he also died during that battle, this one, yep, that same battle, they all, they all died in that one battle, you remember the battle with the snow, yep, yep, that, that took like half the units. This game also told me who the MVP was of every chapter so far and I thought it was pretty interesting since I love me some stats. My 
top 5 MVPs were Alfred, Citrine and Panette, tied for 3rd place after getting MVP in 4 major battles. In number 2 we have Fire Emblem Papaya with 8 MVPs. And in number 1, it's not who you would think, it's Etie, the buff bow user. She was my main DPS this entire run. Anyways, that's Fire Emblem Engage. I wanted to just try something new with this video, so I hope you enjoyed it. And if you're still here, please leave me a comment with who your favorite character was from this run, or if you've played this game, who your favorite character was from this game. Anywho, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and uh, I hope you have a zappy day.